Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Josh Levine. and I have business responsibility globally for the AWS Alliance at CSE. And I'd like to welcome you today to our presentation on large-scale AWS migrations. I'd like to introduce Kevin Aylward, who is our speaker for this afternoon. He is a CSC Distinguished Architect and the Director of CSC's AWS Center of Excellence. And what's great about this presentation, guys, is that this isn't a bunch of slideware. Kevin's actually done it, and that's the purpose of today. So Kevin led the solutioning for CSC's $1 billion deal with the Federal Aviation Administration. And he is one of our technical leaders for CSC's Global Alliance. Uh, for AWS. So please give, wait, actually before we welcome Kevin, I got a two second commercial. You guys all have cards on your seat right here. If you go to the CSC alcove, which is on level three, you can trade it in for a very nice charger, which is actually gonna be a collector's item as of March when CSC and HPE merge into one company with a new codename we don't even know. So there you go. Thank you very much and I'll hand it over to Kevin. Thanks, Josh. So this afternoon, we've, I've got uh, a lot of content and, and not a lot of time. So uh, I'm gonna, you know, this topic could do three, four hundred slides. So fortunately for you, I'm not going to do three or four hundred slides. But uh, we're going to cover the three main areas. First, uh, an overview of the AWS Cloud Adoption Framework. Hold on just a second. I need to, to delete or make this notes a little smaller. Uh, second, go into some planning and execution uh, considerations for large-scale migrations. And third, uh, de detail uh, a case study you know, from CSC's past and a bit of amalgamation of a couple different customers, uh, some of the lessons learned on large-scale migration. And then um, the idea is to have a, some time at the end for questions, so I'm gonna go fast. So the cloud adoption framework is the first thing uh, I wanted to talk about. Uh, hopefully some of you are aware of that. That's a AWS provided cloud migration framework. Uh, and I am not gonna go super deep into it. I will encourage you uh, to go out and you know, download that material and, and pour through it first. So the cloud adoption framework is uh, some of the keys to success according to the cloud adoption framework are your strong executive sponsorship uh, you need to define cloud standards and develop really a cloud operating model. So it's not enough you know, to just do the migration, right? You need uh, a plan for once you finish migration. So um, mass migration is just one project as part of an overall cloud adoption framework. Uh, if you want to think the migration as a step in execution along the path of organizational change, that's what I'd like you to take away, right? So a large-scale migration is a project as part of an overall bigger you know, organizational change. Um, if you just move everything to AWS and you don't change your practices along the way, you're probably not gonna get the benefits you're hoping to get out of a move to AWS. Hold on. Okay. So uh, a quick overview of the Cloud Adoption Framework. It's a um, simple process, an agile process to, to achieving sustainable business value from implementing AWS. So uh, it's a four-phase framework, uh, gets into aligning a, a cloud and business strategy, uh, rapid discovery and planning, realizing and sustaining business value, and an innovation and transformation. My notes are too small to be able to see. I'm going to have to come back here. Uh, so I would really encourage you to all go download the, the um, Cloud Adoption Framework material. One of the nice things about Amazon is these things are not hidden behind paywalls, right? All of their documentation is open and available to you to really go into study. So in large-scale migrations, what I want to talk about now is some of the considerations for you to take into account in large-scale migrations. First, uh, let's look at some of the driving events, right? Large-scale AWS migration almost always has a key driver, right? Uh, enterprises are either decided they have to go to, to AWS, uh, you know, such as you know, a data center lease expiring or some, some change in physical locations. So that's one scenario for a, a large-scale migration to AWS. Another is you know, an all-in or you know, the, uh, what we call a need to go, right? So, that either strategically the company has decided, you know, we're all in with Amazon. You, you will hear many companies 
up on the uh, keynote stage this week who you know, have made that decision. They're still faced with these kind of issues of how, you know, when we say, after we say we're all in, you know, what does that now mean, right? So there can be a variety of reasons, you know, a switch from CapEx to OpEx, uh, you know, a strategic decision, or really any number of combinations of those. The key, one of the key deterministic factors of a migration is the timeline, right? So in, def in thinking about large-scale migration, almost everything, if you think back to the last slide, you know, a data center lease expiring is a timeline event, right? So how you organize and execute the migration almost always is dictated by a timeline event. These are typical timeline events we'll see in large AWS migration at the enterprise. Uh, one of the case studies we'll talk about at the end, you know, is more in the short, you know, short duration, you know, a force, forcing function. Not a data center closure, but a split of a company into two pieces. So how you do treatments of, of applications, migration, uh, will definitely change based on your timeline. So how do we define a large-scale migration? Uh, it's typically thousands of servers, anywhere you know, from 1,000, 10,000, 20,000. Uh, it, it will have an aggressive migration timeline, like we talked about timeline as a, as a forcing function, right? And it will also have a large number of participants. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but it's differentiated from uh, you know, a smaller migration where you have a smaller number of participants. And then the last piece is a combination of the above, right? So as you're starting to think about these things, think about them in terms of, um, you know, those, those factors. So what we've learned over the years is that, you know, the information is really the key uh, or lack thereof, right? So a large AWS migration really amplifies issues with what you know about your landscape and inventory and you know servers and apps and it is the major factor in you know if you succeed or you know don't succeed as much in a migration so what we've what we've seen an aws pro serve will tell you similar type things right tooling lack of knowledge about your you know your current environment limited or, or outdated cmdb information all of these things are going to impact your ability to migrate And then a, a couple other things in continuation. So um, you're going to have a team. You know, a large-scale migration is going to require a team. And, and often, it's in the enterprise, it's it's more complicated than in a smaller IT shop. So you can think of the team. So maybe enterprise IT is the the group that's sponsoring the migration, but they have different different business units who may or may not you know already be using Amazon. And then they could have various system integrators are responsible for different towers of things within their, you know, corporate environment. So one system integrator might do infrastructure, another might do apps and database or app development. So consider the migration team, now you're organizing not just disparate units within the enterprise, but now disparate, you know, system integrators, and you're building a team of literally potentially hundreds, and you have the contracts and various things you have to make sure you know people are playing all to the same tune so that really goes back to the executive sponsorship and then bandwidth almost always you know in our experience comes up um, the three things discovery management scale bandwidth are the constants we typically see across these uh, large-scale migration against so two quick slides differentiating small and larger migrations right uh, the, kind of the key takeaways is in a smaller migration, you, you can get away with substituting labor for automation. You know, if you, if you think of it, if I throw enough people at a small migration event, I can do it, right? The fact that I'm, I'm you know, deficient in maybe my knowledge of the environment, well, I can go out and, and survey people you know, to, to get 50 or 100 servers under, you know, under control. When you're into, into the thousands and tens of thousands, you know, labor at that scale is not really an option. So, switching to large migrations, this is where 
you really need you know to automate through the project process, right? So um, you're talking about automation of discovery, uh, you know, automation of creation of move groups and, and tiering of application treatments, and we'll get into that in a little bit. But like I said, tens, hundreds of staff, combinations of IT business units, system integrators, third-party partners, third-party tools. It's a you know it's heavy-duty project management in terms of actually conducting the migration. So let's go into a little bit about sort of a representational migration playbook, what happens, and some of the issues to address. So you'll see this in the Cloud Adoption Framework and some other frameworks. Typical, you know, workload migration playbook, you know, can have typically like nine phases, right? So it'll vary, but there's maybe 40 activities that flow off these, and you know, it's, it's a process, it's a project management process. Um, but you have discover, plan, provision your infrastructure, capture images, deploy, configure, do data syncs, what's the last one? Test, cut over, yeah. So we're gonna, get, we're gonna dig down a little deeper. So I'll keep saying, t key takeaways, right? So you will see some sometimes talk about six R's. Um, and I would point you to Stephen Orban, if you don't know who he's, he is. He's enterprise, uh, I don't know his exact title, but he's with Amazon, he's their VP of global um, uh, enterprise solutions for, uh, for Amazon. And he, in, uh, if you Google him, uh, he's written several posts on Medium that, that take this concept and dig it down into much more detail in each one. I'll just touch briefly on them, right? Um, so six R's, rehost, that's, that's one you're probably familiar with, right? You move your app or your servers to AWS. Replatform can, can vary, but typically it involves changing a platform and as, as part of moving to AWS. So think of a classic example of your existing system as Windows 2003, and you, know, you, you need to instantiate it on AWS on 2008. Well, that's a replatforming re event. Or you, know, you, have a, you have Oracle running on Solaris, and you're gonna put it on RDS and AWS. So it's not a straight you know, lift and shift migration, you're replatforming or, or changing as part of that. Uh, repurchase you know, is, is kind of a, a newer option, right? So you have something on premise, and you're, you know, typically you'll see it as, hey, I'm gonna move to a SaaS provider instead of you know, actually reinstantiating all those servers on AWS, you know, and now I can buy it as a SaaS option. I don't have to host any of that. Um, refactor is, is the, the big one, the killer, right? So that's app modernization, recoding, changing an existing enterprise app, right? Um, and then retire and retain, you know, kind of similar, right? You know, you're gonna stop using the app for retire, you leave it behind, and or for retaining, you leave that behind, you don't actually move that. So like I said, I would, you know, Google Stephen Orban in the six R's, you'll find a series of posts on uh, Medium that, you know, it has one post, I think, per, per R. So at CSC, this is how we represent the cloud journey to our customers, different treatment paths. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize this was a build. Uh, different treatment paths for different um, outcomes all along the R's. I'm gonna move forward to, there we go. So with the um, workload migration playbooks are gonna vary uh, based on the path in this migration model you're in, right? So you can do standard you know, VM conversion. What we're gonna spend more time talking today about is kind of live migrations. Not as much maybe about the, the first couple, but those are treatment options for the lift and shift type migration, right? So. There are a lot of tools in the marketplace, partner tools that can help. These are some that, that CSC uses, but there are others, right? Uh, and uh, we keep, you know, we're constantly evaluating the market uh, for the best tooling around the various, you know, um, capabilities. So 
um, go through. So we are using we use risk networks for application discovery, Racimi for you know, live migrations. Uh, CSC ourselves does a lot of the non-supported OS works because we really haven't found tooling sets to do mainframe to you know uh, to AWS or variants of HPUX and Solaris. You know. Those involve applying some physical labor, right? There are containerization capabilities. Well, <laughs> there are some containerization capabilities you can use for migrations like App Zero, or you, know, you can just implement Docker. Uh, for database migrations, AWS database migration services is a, a newer option and a good option. Uh, and you, know, you can build some of your capabilities there. And then for, for non critical stuff, you can either instantiate new or you know, use some tools like the um, VM import program. So how we at CSC sort of show this journey to our customers is in a collection of offerings around the similar migration process, right? So discrete pieces in there along advise, plan, migrate, verify, and manage, optimize, right? So if you think of, you know, a consultancy, you know, we try and package up offerings to then say, okay, you know, migrate or assess, migrate, manage, optimize. And there's a variety of things we'll talk about a little, some of those going forward in uh, the various phases. Flip back to that. So in our migration service offering, and I'll, I'll try and go through these real fast, right? We've sort of put together the discovery migration phase uh, using RISC, using Racimi, using tooling and labor to standardize and implement large scale migrations. And we're gonna get into a little bit, a couple slides further around the assessment phase and the automation of that. The key piece, and I'm sorry if I'm going fast, but we've got a lot of slides to get through. The key piece is the app modernization piece. And this is, you know, for us, it's a differentiating factor because we are a large company. We have a large, you know, digital app modernization factory you know, capability. It's harder if we were a much smaller company to say, yeah, we can fix 10,000 apps for you that you can funnel into a factory and they come in as COBOL and they come out as Java, and you can now run them on AWS. We'll get into the classification a bit as we talk through assessment, but you'll start to see patterns emerge in these migrations that there's these different categories, and this one, app modernization, is, is the hardest of the problems to solve. The, the overall knowledge about how to do lift and shift live migrations and some of these things has evolved over the last you know, five years. We're pretty good at it as a market now. It's app modernization you know, is something that's really coming along. So cloud migration discovery. Like I said earlier, you know, the key to do 10,000 know, 10, server migration to AWS is really understanding what you currently have and how to organize the information in a way to be valuable in a migration scenario. So we've got nothing but data in, in most large enterprises. It's really, you know, what data is valuable and then how can I use that to help make decisions about what this migration should look like. So currently in many enterprises, right, you know, if you have a CMDB, you know, maybe it's up to date, maybe not. Um, when we, when we talked about small scale and large scale migrations, you can do assessments and analysis in a small scale migration, you know, kind of manually, right? You can contact the app owners, build a profile, create a questionnaire, kind of get enough data to understand what it is. If you're talking 10,000 servers or 1,000 servers, you don't have the time, especially if you have a timeline event forcing you to make this migration, you don't have the time to go out and do that kind of data collection. You need tooling to automate that process to get you to the 90% and 95% level of you know, data collected and then apply your last 5% of brain power to say, ah, okay, you know, this is this. So a good assessment automation tool will not only gather this information, but it's really gonna classify it for you. So the, the key thing you start thinking about is uh, move groups, right? So ideally your, your assessment tooling should be agent agentless and, and not every and not everyone is. But you know, think about ten thousand servers, you know, it's hard to get agents on ten thousand servers. I mean if in an enterprise, you know, there could be 
RFC processes you have to go through or change control boards and just to load an agent to collect the data, right? So an agent list approach, if you're on a timeline migration event, it's gonna help you out a lot, right? Um, the next big thing is it, to really help you identify what we call move groups, right? So the classic move group example is Microsoft Exchange. So take Microsoft Exchange on-prem, put it in AWS, fail, right? You can't move Exchange off on-prem without bringing along in some form or fashion Active Directory because it's so deeply intertwined with uh, Exchange. So that's kind of a move group concept, right? So you identify 100 servers, you know, and most tools can do that, right? Say, so here's your Exchange servers. Now, from an automation of discovery, it's really useful to be, have your tooling know, okay, yes, it's SAP or it's Exchange or it's SharePoint, what else needs to come at the same time as part of your migration to, you know, to make this work? And that's a move group concept. So you want as much automation as you can get out of your tooling to do that. Live migrations, there's several tools out there. I'm gonna sort of focus on the Racimi tool for now on, on you know, what a live migration is. But at its heart, you can think of it as syncing a on-prem and you know, a provisioned in AWS copy of the same server and keeping those in sync until the migration process is validated and you turn off the old one. So uh, you clone an image of your on-prem system into your new environment at AWS, data is kept in sync. You, know, you can do you know, a sprint of moves, maybe 15, 20, 50 servers. Once you've gone through your checklist of validations, yes, this is good, you, know, you turn off the old ones new ones are in place. As part of the process, you know, there are some, you know, when you're talking about migration, live migration tooling, you know, most all of the tools, including the ones from Amazon, you know, do, you know, can allow you to inject some stuff, right? So you, you want to avoid the garbage in, garbage out conundrum of, hey, I just copied it, I put it over there, but it, maybe it wasn't quite right. So you can start with a base image, inject you know, the controls and the tooling you want in your more pristine AWS state into these images, and the data is still synced, right? So I'm still going very fast. I'm sorry. Um, from a, an event standpoint, then we get to, you know, what does a migration event look like? Well, you know, if you, you want to avoid a kind of legacy PM type approach of waterfall steps, right? You're looking to, to take your team of hundreds, right? Build them off into little groups that are focused on the different treatment paths. So you have a, a group that's doing the live migrations. You, know, you have a different group that's focused on the app modernization. You have a different group focused on the replatforming. And then literally use an agile process to, to run through this methodology. You know, move group by move group by move group. All right, so time-wise, I'm actually doing pretty good now. Getting into the project management, literally we could go, you know, 200 slides on, you know, agile migration project management. Um, but to condense it, basically, uh, you know, and, and if you talk to AWS ProServe, we would recommend you do that and build your team from you know, solution partners, consulting partners, AWS ProServe, and your own staff is that you need to coalesce that team around sort of a central point of truth and a uh, migration portal. I think you'll see things in the future, you know, where those toolings, migration portals will be something, you know, you can get, right? But as it is now, you're tending to need to build it or re repurpose something. So can you use SharePoint? Probably. Uh, you know, we tend to use Jira, but you know, whatever, whatever kind of tooling you need, uh, the key is to create a, to create a centralized portal, portal and consume the stats you know, and stop being, you know, trying to do it all with spreadsheets, right? So when you're talking hundreds and thousands of systems, it's real nice if your tooling will in, you know, deliver stats to a dashboard and you can see where you are uh, step by step and that assignments to teams and sprints 
are happening out of a, a single location. So a couple of automation pieces, you know, central knowledge portal, having playbooks, migration cookbooks. These are the type of things you, you know, that really define success and failure in an enterprise migration. Uh, you know, the, the tools are out there. It's how well you implement them, how you go through a process, and really you know, bring, in some, some, you know, bring in some folks who understand DevOps, bring in some you know, old line project managers and train them up on how these migration processes work, right? We've, we've repurposed several you know, classic PMs into cloud migration PMs, and you know, they do bring knowledge, they do bring capabilities. So, so let's look at, uh, quickly at a case study. Um, in 2015, CSC, we, we were constantly evolving, right? Josh talked about us merging with HP Enterprise Services, HPE Enterprise Services, in um, at the end of March in 2017. Last year, CSC split off our public sector business in North America to form a new publicly traded company called CSRA. So you can see up top, May 19th, it was announced. Uh, they rang the bell on the NYSC on November 1st. 2015. So a new company was created out of CSC in about four and a half months. So CSC is a 50-year-old company. We have every IT system you can imagine, right? SAP, you know, Salesforce. Uh, we didn't have Workday at the time. You know, we had things that were hand-built generations ago. What you would typically see in a large enterprise, right? A, a collection of tooling like that. So the challenge was, in creating a new company, you're ripping apart IT systems, your HR system. You know, we had one HR system, a new company with no HR system, but needed the data, tear it apart, instantiate it again, and do that in four months. So you can see sort of the mechanics of, of what happened here. So how do you attack the problem, right? So in the face, so we're, we're now faced with reaching back to the beginning of the deck, a have-to-move scenario, right? I said the timelines and the, the, the business drivers are going to drive your, your solutioning in, in terms of how you create this migration capability. Well, four and a half months and you know, no option to really extend and you know, a large number of servers. So, We used our process. We used basically the same process. We brought AWS ProServe in, used CSC, CSRA folks, used partners to you know run the cloud adoption you know, framework methodology on our own. You know, ate our own dog food basically. Um, this is kind of some dashboard views. Like I said, I could go a hundred slides into this particular project, but. This is kind of a scoreboard view of the discovery phase and the suitability scorecards that were created. If you think back to the six R's we talked about, um, the majority of the treatments were, you know, kind of listed up here. Um, we had, up in the top you can see the, the different types of applications that were discovered, uh, whether they were you know, only use the CSE, only use in the public sector business if they were, uh, you know, overlapping. And then moving forward, developed application treatments off of, you know, and that's a summary of a lot of automated data that was gathered. So application treatments became do not move, do, don't migrate. They're, you know, we're not going to change it. It exists at a data center that's going to be part of the new company. There was some sort of physical move that required. That was another treatment, like a, a location that wasn't going to be part of the new company's portfolio of locations. We had to pick it up and put it in a van and move it to someplace that was. Uh, and then the key one, the last two were the key ones, migrated to, to AWS GovCloud. You know, since CSC was a or CSRA, you know, services government customers, they needed the the security and the ITAR compliance of AWS GovCloud. And then another, you know, less intuitive option was 
pick and move from an on-prem to a SaaS provider. And this just is kind of more detail. You can see Workday, Taleo, Risk. These are, when we talk about building teams, we talk about building teams with, you know, with AWS technology partners, leveraging their skills and strengths, right? The folks at any number of them are going to be more skilled on their tooling and their tools than you are, right? In, in, a, in a force event, you need, you need to bring on not just their tools, right? You might need some of their, their services. And AWS ProServe you know, does this for a living. It's good. You, know, you probably have some arrangement with them already, uh, at, at least at the enterprise level, where you might have a relationship. And uh, you can always get it through a company like CSC or any of the other um, premier consulting partners that will, you know, AWS will invest in a migration of events. You know, they'll contribute some labor and, and people time because it's really about the process planning. And then at the bottom, you know, the SaaS providers are, you know, kind of a newer emerging capability, right? You might be moving something and say, hey, you know what? We're not going to move it. We're going to either leave it in place or decommission. We're going to go to, you know, a SaaS offering now for this. This was... Uh, you know, at a high level, this is kind of the architecture we ended up on. We ended up with multiple uh, different AWS accounts uh, to provide IAM role separation, you know, resource uh, isolation, and, you know, limit, you know, sort of standard things like limiting blast radius for, you know, in case of a human error, right? Um, you built, you know, the, all of these things were sort of foundational in the migration, building federated SSO, creating VPC structure, Understanding IP, you know, address allocations, and uh, you know, changes that had to come as part of the migration. So, and then we talked a lot about migration, but you know, once you get there, as as we talked in the cloud adoption framework, you need a plan for how to manage because your tooling for what you manage on premise may or may not work. So, the classic example I use to folks is if you spin up. A thousand, you know, uh, thousand node cluster to do some analytics, and you have an IT rule that everything has to be consumed into the I, uh, CMDB you know, as a corporate server. It's like, well, if that's up for an hour. You know, the old way of doing it doesn't work with things that are up for a, a couple hours, right? That you get a get a, a corporate machine name and those kinds of things. Do they need antivirus? Those are the decisions you end up making in terms of operations at scale, because you're now talking tens of thousands of servers on AWS where you have IT staffs and support systems that are kind of built to manage on-prem physical devices. So it's, it's a not to be overlooked portion of the process is how do I reskill my IT support functions to deal with Amazon? So in this particular case study and in, in most of our others, right, so hybrid environments are obviously um, often, you know, the result of, of a large-scale migration event. So you have some combination of data in Amazon, things that remain on-prem, and things that are, you know, moved to SaaS or SaaS providers. Um, in this project, you know, we had four months. It was a drop-dead uh, event and you know, we, we threw a lot of work at it, used Jira, used the migration portal concept, and lots of sprint teams for move groups that were identified. Not every treatment worked, right? So, you know, we you you set a goal for an automation level and and a cost per server, uh, you know, migration cost. So, what I will tell you about costs in these situations is you are front loaded on labor costs, right? So. If you think of a 10,000 server migration, and you know, you're front loaded in labor um, for planning, and, and if you try and spread that across the first 100 servers, you know, your cost per server migration is going to be you know, $10,000 a server, some, you know, some large number. What you're trying to build as part of this process is kind of the factory migration approach as you're developing these teams that do you know, sprints and they're focused on either lift and shift or replatformer, and that they have developed cookbooks and playbooks that then bring the, the successive costs down 
for you know the the two thousandth workload to you know dollars right not dollars but you know they're they're doing it very fast in a very automated fashion and then your your average price per server for this migration is you know is where you start seeing that number go way down once you're well into the automation flipping forward. So the biggest things we've seen from not just this case study, but from our other enterprise customers who've done these migrations is, you know, the, the planning for the bandwidth. So if you're, do, especially when you're doing live migrations uh, um, or you're, you're doing the you know, things with receiving where you're keeping things in sync, like I say, at 100 servers, not an issue. At thousands of servers, you know, keeping those in sync across your, you know, T1, Direct Connect, or whatever you, you have in place uh, from on-prem to AWS, that becomes an issue. In our case, IPs became an issue. Extend, you know, doing Direct Connect, extending our subnets onto AWS was an issue, right? We had um, a public uh, IP subnets, and you know, you will find in older systems, IPs that were built right into the software, right? You know, it's like they couldn't handle changes in, in IP, right? You had to go dig into the system, fix IP stuff. Um, and the, the, the last thing I'll tell you about the, you know, the sort of success project is utilize partners. Utilize AWS technology partners, AWS consulting partners. It's like, you know, there's a lot of them up on that board. Most all of them, um, or, or a large number of them, have the AWS migration competency. So. The AWS migration competency is important because that tells you that technology partner, or that consulting partner, has been audited and validated by Amazon in using processes that Amazon knows work for these kind of large-scale migrations. I'm just going to flip to a, two slides that just talk about CSC briefly and then get to questions. But CSC, like... Josh said earlier, we're merging with HPES at the end of the calendar year, uh, or at the end of our fiscal year. Um, but we're a global system integrator, and you know we've transitioned to next-gen technologies. Um, we have you know several. We have 400 or so AWS certified folks around the world, and we've been moving customers uh, in digital journeys for quite a long time. And then in terms of offerings, we built out a, a collection of offerings around this migration process with, with a few others added. So big data, cloud migration services, managed service provider for you know, when you land on Amazon, we provide that capability. Um, security services uh, with a, a global SOC collect, um, capability to monitor your AWS environments or our customers' AWS environments. And then cloud network services, which allows you to do AWS Direct Connect and other capabilities. So those are the type of services we sell to our customers. I'll get off of that and back to uh, takeaways. So migrations, we talked a lot about migrations and a bit about uh, transformation, but Migration is a, 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 an event in a larger transformation. That's what we would tell you from our years of experience doing this, is just the migration event, even if you've fully automated or mostly automated and you do, do the successful pieces of it, unless you've got a transformation framework in place, you know, you'll, you'll do a great migration, you'll end up with an Amazon, and you'll be like, okay, what do I do now? If you haven't changed how you operate, it's not that great. So automation, obviously, at, at, at large scale is key. But as you can kind of see from the presentation, and I've given this to other folks, it's a lot about process, right? I mean, you will succeed in large scale migrations to the extent that you build a good process. Uh, and that's where bringing in partners and, and folks like Amazon, CSC, the Racimis of the world, and, and, or, you know, and, or other folks, Right, who've done it before will help. But you really want to build your own cloud knowledge, you know, cloud center of excellence, right, as part of this. So that you're defining operating models to go forward. Because if you rely completely on a vendor to do it for you, 
you'll get to the other end and you know, won't know what you're doing. So it's really key that a, a large enterprise invest, have executing sponsorship, and to the extent possible, lead the project, right? Um, use the partners you know, to, to fill in where you don't have the capabilities, but you, know, you need to put your own skin in the game if you're a large enterprise doing this migration. If you just outsource it all, I mean, you know, our bosses at CSC, we would probably love it, but I think you, you do yourself a disservice if you're not fully invested in, in doing the capabilities yourself. Let's see where I'm at time-wise. All right, just about where I want it to be. So I'll take questions at this point. Thank you.